Father, we come before you, Lord, and um, we think about the times of testing that you allow in our life, that you have a purpose and plan for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that your plan continues. I pray that we might respond well in times of trial. And Father, that we might give thanks and everything for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. We know that the Savior went through testing and trials, but he was obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And as a result, Father, he lifted him up and given him a name which is above every name that at one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Help us to continue to run this race by faith, we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So help us to see the importance of taking in doctrine on a consistent basis so that we might be equipped to do your work. And Father, we might be a light in a dark place that Lord, that we might shine our light before men that they might see our good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Help us to understand your word this morning Sanctify the believers here through your truth, because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's so open the Bible to the 7th chapter of John. John chapter 7. And uh, we'll begin in verse 1. Jesus Christ is entering into his final year of ministry. As a matter of fact, we will see that the early events of chapter 7 occur in the fall of AD 33. So in that period or time frame, Jesus Christ is, in, is increasingly experiencing hostility and hatred, and even individuals who want to murder him, who are uh, angry at what he stands for and what he teaches. And this occurred... Uh, obviously, we know that in AD 33, in the following year, in the spring, Jesus will be crucified on the cross. So this is a period of time, again, where Jesus, not willing to shorten God's plan, avoided a certain period of time going out, going down to Jerusalem. Well, he finally did so. We will see that in the text. But the Jews were out to get him. They were out to kill him. So let's take a look at chapter 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. He did not walk, he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is already always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. So here Jesus, at this point in his ministry, did not want to go down to Jerusalem and walk out publicly in the open because the Jews sought to take his life. Now the phrase in John chapter 1 begins with after these things. The time frame we know because we know that this is the fall of <coughs> AD 32 because of the feast mentioned in verse 2. The Jews feast of the tabernacles was at hand and typically this was a fall feast. John is good at giving us these feasts as time markers and, the chrono and it helps us put these in a chronological perspective. For instance, in John chapter 6, verse 4, the prior chapter, we have the Feast of Passover. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. That was April 25th, AD 32. So the opening events of John chapter 6, including the feeding of the 5,000, occurred approximately a year before he was crucified. So we had that, those events that started out the last year of Christ's life. So John takes us from Passover to Passover and his gospel. Here, though, we have the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a fall feast. 
That feast occurred September 10th to 17th, AD 32. So this would be in the fall before his crucifixion, that chapter seven, these events occur. So we see a definite shift though, as this year progresses, a greater shift in hostility and outright animosity against the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that will eventually lead to his death in the spring of the following year. The land of Israel was divided into three provinces. Notice he did not. He walked in the region of Galilee. We have a second region called Judea. He didn't want to walk. And there the temple was located in Jerusalem. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees and those that hated him and wanted to kill him, they primarily were in the land of Judea. So he wanted simply, his ministry at this point was simply around the Sea of Galilee. He walked in that region, but he did not want to walk in that region south of them, Judea, because in that area, the Jews sought to kill him. Now, we'll look at a map here in a minute, but the land of Israel was divided into three provinces, Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. Galilee occupied the upper portion of the land being the Northwest Providence. So if you look at this map here, of the land of Israel around the time of Christ, we see that the Galilean region, including Christ's hometown of Nazareth, the area where he turned water into wine, Cana, and Capernaum where he did a majority of his miracles, or quite a few, 20 or more. So miracles, I think, were performed in or around Capernaum. He walked in the water as well. We see the feeding of the 5,000, which is the area of Decapolis. On the other side of the shore, Jesus ministered in the synagogue at Capernaum. Uh, he healed individuals in that region. So his ministry was based primarily in the area of Galilee. Now he did on occasion go down to Jerusalem because male Jews were required uh, two or three times a year to go down to the temple. And uh, so Jesus eventually ended up in the region of Jerusalem, but he delayed. So Samaria is that region between Galilee and Judea, would that be that southern region, Gentile regions on the other side of the Jordan River with Perea and Decapolis. Decapolis is a term for the Greeks, 10 cities. So we have 10 major cities in that region, um, and that's why it's called the Decapolis. So those are the various regions there uh, in the land of Israel. Now, this further map indicates the journey here from Capernaum all the way down to the region of Galilee. So Christ is ministering here along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, the northeastern section of the Sea of Galilee. And eventually he would take the journey all the way further south uh, down through the area to the city of Jerusalem. But he avoided that because of the hostility of the Jews. Now, Several places in this section, it indicates that the Jews wanted to kill him. Further on, John chapter 7, we see this, and uh, the Jews mentioned there in chapter 7, verse 11, then the Jews sought him at the feast. Now, the seeking there was for the purpose of finding him and killing him. We know that because look at verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? <laughs> Why do you seek to kill me. So they're seeking him for the wrong reasons. They're seeking him to kill him. And the people said, oh, you got to be kidding. This is ridiculous trying to say that we're trying to try to kill you. See, Jesus knew their hearts. He knew their motives. And they tried to avoid that directly. But he said, you know, you have a demon. You have a demon. This is not God's message. Uh, this is falsehood. Who is seeking to kill you? <laughs> you know, we're not. No, they were. <laughs> uh, Jesus, in verse 25, notice, now some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? See, even others recognize that those religious leaders were out to get him. They understood that. They understood their hostility. Um, in verse 30, therefore they sought to take him. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. They wanted to take him there, but uh, it wasn't under 
it wasn't in God's plan. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't have been crucified. It was God's plan for him to go to the cross. Uh, verse chapter 8, look at chapter 8, verse 37 and 40. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. That's why. That's why you're hostile against me. Against me. That's why people today hate Christ. Not only do they not accept Christ, they hate Christ, and they hate people who stand for truth. They hate Christians because they're part of the world system. And the Bible says the world will not embrace us. The world will not uh, you know, accept us. Uh, the world will be uh, the ones who hate us, and Jesus predicted that. And that we, not, we need not to be amazed that there are unsaved people, and no matter how kind and nice and gracious, they're hostile because of what you stand for. And uh, so chapter 8, verse 37, uh, they, don't, they seek to kill Christ because the word of God has no place in them. Look at verse 40. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. And then, you know, they further denied that he was who he claims to be in that section. So... Certainly this was a period of intense hostility in Christ's ministry. John chapter 1 summarizes this uh, as far as his own people who rejected him. He came to his own, and that refers to the Jews, and his own did not receive him. His own people. And uh, they rejected him. And by the way, we will see not only his nation, the, the, the leaders of the nation, but in the same section in John chapter 7, we will see his family. Even his own family members did not believe in him at that time. They rejected him. So not only did he have the opposition of hostility to the nation, and the, especially the leaders of the nation, his own family members did not understand him and did not embrace him as the Messiah the Son of God. So John 1, 11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him, but as many as receive him, to them he gave right to become children of God, eat to those who do what? Believe in his name. How do you receive Christ? Believe in him. Exercise faith alone in Christ alone. So God welcomes those who accept him, no matter who they are. It's interesting that we can become part of God's family even closer than his own physical brethren at that time. And that's what even Jesus said teaching, by the way. Remember when his family members at one occasion approached him? Hey, your brothers are out there. Your family's out there. But, you know, he talked about his family who was sitting and hearing the word of God. Let's take a look at Psalm chapter 31. Psalm chapter 31, verses 11 through 24. I think this song fits well what Christ was going through. Uh, here we have a song of David, but I think in the song of David, this reflects the person of Christ. I don't think this is directly prophetic necessarily so, but I do believe it mirrors certainly uh, the events of Christ's life at this time. Um, chapter 31, verse 11. I am a, a reproach among all my enemies, but especially among my neighbors. And I am repulsive to my acquaintances. Those who see me outside flee from me. I am forgotten like a dead man out of mine. I am like a broken vessel. For I hear the slander of many. Fear is on every side while they take counsel together against me. They scheme to take away my life. And certainly this is also true in the life of Christ as it was in David's life. They attempt to kill me. But as for you, I trust in you, O God. Think about that, o Lord. You know, my focus is upon you, not on my enemies, not on those who would even want to remove my life. I say, you are my God. Verse 15, my times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies. Remember, he said, my time has not yet come because it wasn't God's plan for him to die yet. It would be the following year and it would be perfectly in God's will and plan, but it wasn't his time at this period of time. 
Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me for your mercy's sake. Do not let me be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon you. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak insolent things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you, in the presence of the sons of men. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown, his, shown me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplication when I cried out to you. O oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays the proud person. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Now, the lapse here, it might be a lapse uh, in the chronology between chapters 6 and 7 of uh, some months. Jesus remained in Galilee, as we saw in chapter 6. It was around the events of the Passover and thereafter. Here, it's more like the fall of the year. Jesus remained in Galilee. He did not want to stay in Judea, which was headquarters for the Jews because they sought to kill him. It is generally agreed that the Jews referred to in this verse were the leaders or rulers. They were the ones who hated the Lord Jesus Christ most bitterly and who sought opportunities to kill him. You can read the account later, Matthew chapter 23, the hostility of the Pharisees, when Jesus called him hypocrites, hypocrites. And uh, those are the ones who uh, were opposed to him. The time of this is around the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus, uh, John says the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Now, when we look at the seven feasts of Israel in the Old Testament, and especially in the book of Leviticus, this is one of the fall feasts. Scripture prescribes two pilgrimages or festivals in the spring, Passover and Pentecost. Remember at Pentecost, which occurred in the spring, 50 days after Christ's resurrection, the, the Jews were in Jerusalem, God's timing to begin the church. Uh, but this one occurred in the fall of the year. Now, this joyful eight-day festival of tabernacles commemorated Israel's experience in the wilderness. Remember how they lived in booths. So they put up these little uh, lean-tos, I would call them, <laughs> like in your camping and you want to provide shelters, these lean-tos, these little booths to reflect God's protection in the wilderness and their, their journey in the wilderness. So that's part of the celebration of the Feast of, some call it the Feast of Booze, or Booze or the Feast of Tabernacles. During this time, Jewish men would build and spend time in booths or shelters built with branches, sometimes even on their home and on the flat roof of their homes. Now, the Feast of Booths, a great harvest festival celebrating Israel's redemption out of Egypt, and also prophetically looks forward to the nation's future establishment in the kingdom. Now, let's take a look at two references. The feast itself that's uh, mentioned in Leviticus 23, verse 34, and then the prophecy about this feast in Zechariah. Uh, Leviticus 23, 34, speak to the children of Israel, saying, the 15th day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. So it would carry on for the entire week. And we'll see later, Jesus did not appear in the first opening parts of that feast, but came midway through, came later toward the end of those seven days. Now, Zechariah chapter 14, prophetically speaking, I think the Feast of Booze point to Israel in the land, in the kingdom. Uh, we know in Zechariah chapter 14, <clears throat> this feast will be celebrated in Christ's millennial reign. 
So Christ returns to the earth. He returns to the Mount of Olives in this chapter. In chapter 14, verse 4, we call that the second coming of Christ. Uh, and then we have rescuing the enemies that surround Jerusalem. And then the Lord will reign over the earth in verse 8. Um, in verse 9, verse 9 says, The Lord shall be king over all the earth. And that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. And then there will be various individuals that will, uh, that will come to the city of Jerusalem to worship the Lord during the Feast of Tabernacles. And those who refuse to go, no rain will be upon their land. So, if, for instance, the example is given of Egypt. If they refuse as a nation to come up to Jerusalem, then God will punish even during the kingdom uh, that nation with no rain. So look at verse eight, 16. It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. So ingrained in that will be the worship of the Messiah. They'll have to come to Jerusalem from all over the nations, not simply the land of Israel. They'll come from all over the world, Jews and Gentiles, to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And all males, though, were required to attend this feast. And so in Jesus' day, that would include him. As a Jewish male, he would be required to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Even though he did not want to make a public display, uh, he came in sort of under the radar and going to this feast. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 16 <coughs> indicates this. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16 Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord, your God, in the place where he chooses. And these feasts that you are to travel to Jerusalem as a male, what's required would be the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Booze, Weeks, or the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And therefore, those were required, a Feast of Pentecost, by the way, included in there. Uh, they were required to travel to Jerusalem. Now, we studied this before, prophetically speaking, that these feasts symbolizes Israel, the nation of Israel. They're not really meant for the church. And a lot of people try to read church events in there, even though the day of Pentecost started the church. Uh, but it's still related to 50 days after the resurrection. But it's interesting, we begin with Christ's death, which is symbol symbolized by the Passover the blood sprinkled on the doorpost. And then the Feast of Eleven and Eleven Bread, the pictures of Believer's Walk. Uh, the Feast of First Fruits would be the Resurrection of Christ. And then the Feast of Pentecost was the day the Holy Spirit came and uh, 50 days later started the church. Then we have this great gap of time. Great gap of time. Then we have many times what's misinterpreted as the rapture, but I think it's symbolic. It's interesting, Larkin did not see this as Feast of Trumpets as symbolizing the rapture, but we have trumpets blown for the regathering of Israel. You see that, by the way, Matthew 24, 31. So if you read Matthew chapter 24, verse 30 and 31, that's the second coming, not the rapture. So this trumpet would be a trumpet blown to regather the nation of Israel back to their land. Isaiah 11 indicates that. So this Feast of Trumpets symbolizes not the rapture, but the regathering of Israel back to their land, which will occur, by the way, after the tribulation period. We'll have a regathering and belief after the Lord cleanses them from their sin. We went over that last week, by the way. So the Feast of um, Trumpets. Then we have the Day of Atonement, and Israel's sins will be cleansed once they return to the land. And then finally, Christ's millennial reign, the period of rest in the land. Booths remaining there, occupying the land. Just like in the wilderness journeys, they were on their way to the promised land. So finally, the Messiah will reign over them, dealing with Israel's millennial rest. So we're talking about this last of the seven feasts of the year that Christ attended, mentioned there in Leviticus 31. Now we zoom in on the last three fall feasts, trumpets, day of atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Notice they all occurred in the same month. Uh, one at the first of the month, one 
about halfway through the month and then the 22nd day of the month we have these back-to-back -back various feasts now uh, Rob Mocker observed this the Feast of Tabernacles was the fall harvest festival to thank God for the success of fruit crops of which the most important were the grape and the olive it also had a historical foundation to remind Israel about their temporary dwellings in the wilderness for 40 years Thus, it was also a thanks to God for preserving Israel during that time and for bringing them safely into the land that they would occupy when they began to observe this festival week. So it looks forward to that land which belongs to them. And that's what they would celebrate as a journey to that feast. Now, verse uh, 3 of chapter 7, not only do we see hostility against the uh, the religious leaders against Jesus? We also see his own family not accepting him. Um, now his own brothers, his physical brothers, did not understand his mission. And uh, they kind of in a mocking way said, hey, why aren't you going up to the feast? You need to go down there and make a public display. By the way, this is similar when Jesus turned the water into wine, remember his mother? And what Jesus, how Jesus responded, Jesus did go ahead and turn water into wine, but you know that was because it was God's plan. Here, though, they did not understand his plan. They thought, hey, if you're the Messiah, show yourself. Then more people will accept you. Um, and therefore, they were giving him, they, they, they misunderstood him, and they were giving him bad advice here and obviously they did not understand Christ so and so this was not said in the sense of hey we we uh, see that you're the Messiah we approve of you this was not given in that sense we could read it and say that wow they want him to you know show that he's Messiah because they believe in him but they did not it was the opposite so it was almost in a sarcastic way that this was given uh, let's take a look at verses 3 and 4 of uh, John 7. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples may also may see the works that you are doing. Hey, they want to witness your miracles. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. And they're misjudging his motives. Hey, if you want to really show yourself Messiah, then you should not be hiding yourself. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. But underlying that was an attitude of unbelief. Look at verse 5. For, connecting the prior verse, even his brothers did not believe in him. See that? Even his brothers did not believe in him. So they're not saying this because they believe he's the Messiah. They're saying, hey, you know, you need to show yourself to everyone. Man. Maybe they'll all believe. Think She's probably thinking, what about you? <laughs> what about you? Now, um, Unger says this, their motives were wrong, being dictated by unbelief. We see that in verse 5. De so Unger says this, their motives were wrong, being dictated by unbelief, and their tone was almost a taunt as they urge him in a selfish, worldly spirit to advertise and exploit his works for personal aggrandizement with no thought of the will of God. Think about that. I think Judas had the same motive. We've been watching the series of Chosen, and I think Judas will become disgruntled with Christ. To, you know, He wants a political kingdom to be established, and Christ will one day rule over the nations of the world, but Judas, though, was looking for Jesus for the wrong reasons. And in a similar way, his brothers, who did not believe that he was the Messiah, thought, you know, why don't you go show yourself if you're really the Messiah? Now look at verse six, verse 15 of chapter 6. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. After he fed the 5,000, see, they wanted to push forward him as a political leader. They wanted him to overthrow Rome. 
It's interesting how behind politicians sometimes are people driving them to do things that they really shouldn't do. What example here, Jesus, you know, and uh, they did not understand his mission and purpose, obviously. Now, the brothers, they had no idea that Jesus' mission in its very nature must be unpopular. Now, automatically, people think that. If you're not, you know, attracting large crowds, then you must not be fulfilling the will of God. And that's not true. Jesus' mission would not receive the approval of the world because there is a hostility against him. And Christians, as believers in Christ, we need to realize the world does not love you. Those in the world. Now, people might be friendly to you. They might be nice to you, but they don't embrace what you embrace if they're not believers in Christ. And don't expect it. And the world will attack, will, will, the world will support his own, and it will attack those who are opposed to the world. And people misunderstand you. Don't be perplexed when people misunderstand your motives, misjudge your, why you do what you do, because they're not of they're not in the family of God. So its mission by its very nature must be unpopular. Um, do not look to unsaved people for divine guidance in your life. This is one of the things I thought about. Even his own family. Have you ever had family members that seemingly wanted to give you good advice, but it was really bad advice? And I'm not talking about that in general. Maybe there's people in your extended family that are not saved. And they want to give you advice that doesn't line up with the word of God. It might reason be sound reasoning reasonable to them. But it's not what God wants you to do. And that's why you have to be careful, even for the even with those who are closest to you. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The soul man does not understand the things of God or the Spirit of God. They cannot give you good biblical advice. Now, they might give you worldly advice about certain things. There's wisdom of the world. The Bible does call it wisdom of the world, but ultimately it's foolishness when they try to counsel you on spiritual things. And therefore, you're not to look to them. And I can give examples of my own life. I won't name names, but individuals who thought they had you know, my best interest in mind, extended family members, who said I should not move to Texas and attend seminary. You know, that would be outside of God's will. It's like, well, I wish God would tell me that. You know, has they ever had someone tell you what God's will was before you know it? <laughs> they know better. Now, if, I'm, if I have the Holy Spirit, right? If I'm walking with the Lord, shouldn't I know that? <laughs> I think you should. And people unknowingly will give you the bad advice even close members of the family, extended family. But you have to do what God wants you to do. You know, it's, it's tragic. I've heard stories of young men and women who wanted to go on the mission field, but even their Christian parents said, oh, you'll never become a success if you do that. You're wasting your time. You're wasting your life. Don't do that. Why don't you pursue a business, a career? Why don't you go here and do this and this and that? Why not do what God wants you to do? Why not do what God wants you to do? And uh, we have to see what God wants uh, in our life, not what people want for you, even those who are close to us. God comes first. And by the way, Jesus said, if you want to be a disciple, a disciple, you need to hate father, mother, sister, and brother. That doesn't mean you need to have animosity toward your family. We are to love our family. But what that is saying here is we are to love the priorities of God more than the priorities of our family. And therefore... Even well-meaning people can give you the wrong advice. That's why you need to be in fellowship with God to discern the will of God and therefore seek God's will. And this wasn't the will for him to make a public display at this point. It wasn't his purpose. They're telling him the wrong thing. 
And their reasoning is humanistic. They're, they're earthly. Well, you know, if you're going to show yourself, why do you want to, anyone who seeks to manifest himself would not do anything in hiding? Now, certainly Jesus did not hide in the early part of his ministry, but keep in mind, in the background, people wanted to kill him. You know? And uh, therefore, I think like in the Apostle Paul, you remember that uh, Paul, there was an assassination plot against Paul. Several people wanted to kill Paul. And he went to Damascus and he escaped out of a basket. There were those who helped him flee. You know, he wouldn't have, well, God's going to protect me. And so it doesn't matter if these people are hostile. I'm just going to walk in the middle of the street and I'm going to do whatever. You know, God has given us, you know, common sense. <laughs> God has given us, you know, uh, God doesn't want us to act in a foolish manner. Now, when it comes down to it, Christ would face the opposition of the crowd and would be crucified. We're not back down when it was God's time, but this wasn't God's time yet. And therefore it would be wrong for him to try to go forward and push himself in this phase of his ministry in such a manner. So this was their reasoning, their thinking. Um, and notice here the comment by Warren, Warren Wiersbe. It was not the right time for Jesus to show himself to the world. One day he shall return and every eye will see him. Revelation 1.7. We have noted that our Lord lived on a divine timetable that was marked out by the Father. The Father had the divine schedule. You need to be here, this location, do it in this manner, and this period of time. And Christ was walking by means of the Spirit. He was walking by God's plan and God's will. And he would not bypass that even by well-meaning family members. Uh, John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 37. Notice earlier that his family, even though they had the evidence, still did not believe. Many of his half-brothers and sisters did not believe. But though, although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Notice that. He did the miracles, but they still did not believe in him. Take a look at another account, Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 57 and 58. Now, um, Let's go back to verse 53. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. We had come down to his own country. He taught them in the synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And he mentioned his brothers in verse 55. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now I did not many do many mighty works here because of their unbelief. Now Christ could be shown openly in Jerusalem, but not in the way they expected. He would show himself openly, but that would be on the way to be crucified. That's a public display, by the way. He did not hide himself. Even there's a passage of, uh, in, I think it's in Isaiah, he did not hide himself from shame and spitting. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter, Isaiah 53. He did not try to conceal who he was, um, and therefore he did not cower from opposition. But here he's not going to do it before God's timing. Now, verse 5 indicates clearly at this time his brothers did not believe in him. These are his half-brothers, of course, because of the virgin birth of Christ. Uh, these will be his half-brothers. They came later. We don't have the false theology of the perpetual virginity of Mary. That is a false uh, uh, view. Um, and the Bible does not teach that. If we look at this chart of Jesus' family, we have four 
brothers mentioned here and sisters. We have a brothers plural and sisters. We have James the Just. And by the way, he later became a believer. He was the first leader of the Jerusalem church. So at what changed? The resurrection was what changed these unbelieving family members to believing family members. I believe that was the catalyst. And here, Joseph, or uh, mentioned there, and uh, I think it's that passage we read in Matthew, Simon. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, another Judas, or Jude. Jude, by the way, would be another brother, half-brother of Jesus, who went on to write the book of Jude. So we look at Jude, um, I think opening verse. Um, let's take a look here, see if it says anything there. Uh, we have Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and his brother James. But this would be the identified as the brother, half-brother of Jesus. And then sisters means two or more. So um, these were children born to Mary and Joseph after the virgin birth of Jesus the half-brothers and sisters of Jesus. So we do see the family members mentioned here uh, in this chart, and two of them, at least, that we know of became believers. Now, I think I have the passage in 1 Corinthians 15 in my notes. Let me look. Let's turn over there right now. I may have this later in my notes. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 The appearances of Christ, some of the resurrection appearances. Um, he mentions here, uh, look at verse, uh, let's, let's look at verse 3 and 4, 3 and following. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel in a nutshell, in a sense that Christ died as our substitute, making our payment for our sin, and he rose from the dead to guarantee eternal life to those who believe. He was seen by Peter, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by 500 brethren at once. That was probably at his ascension. A lot of people think on that Mount Tabor. Some people think it's Tabor, another mount, but there was a group or crowd that was there who witnessed his ascension to heaven. Um, of whom the greater part remain to this present, meaning you can interview them. This is not a mass crowd hallucination. This is one of the strong arguments for the validity of the resurrection. 500 individuals that witnessed this, and you can interview them. But some have fallen asleep. Some have died out of that 500. And then after the, afterwards, he was seen by James. James. And some say that's the half-brother of Christ. And therefore, James witnessed the resurrection because that he uh, became a believer. So Jude and James, his half-brothers, did believe in him, uh, but there's not nothing, not much more than that about his other family members. Okay, let's take a look at a couple passages then. Um, I'm not sure we covered this. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10. Yeah. Verse 34. Do not think that I've come to bring peace on earth. That's not, what his, that's not his purpose in his first coming. That will be his purpose in his second coming, to bring peace on earth, goodwill toward men. In Isaiah 9. But that wasn't the purpose in his first coming. Do not think I, I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. It's kind of strange when you think about it. But Christ came to, you know, divide in one sense. For I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. What this means is not he's not trying to divide the family unit. We should have unity in our family, in our families. He was saying, if you make a stand for Christ and the other family members don't, there's automatically a di division because truth divides. I'll say that again. Truth divides. Let's have unity. Now, certainly, we are, as believers in Christ, to be united within the family. Endeavor to keep the unity of spirit and the glue of peace. 
But if there are those who are not believers, you don't try to be divisive. It's not trying to be obnoxious or divisive. Just by living your light, letting your light shine, darkness will oppose it. And even if those are individuals of your own family, a man's enemies will be his own household. So do we compromise our truth in order to bend to the whims of family members? The answer is no. Clearly no. If you want to be a follower of Christ, look at verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. How many moms or dads have compromised their truth because their children want to do something else? And they're either saved or carnal. And so let's bend to the whims of the kids instead of what God wants me to do. And notice that he who does not take his cross and fall after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. He will lose his life for my sake will find it. Take a look at Mark chapter 6. Mark 6. Verse 3 and 4. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and, and Jose and Judas and, and Simon? Those are the brothers we saw in that chart earlier. Are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. They were offended at him. And Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor except his own country and among his own relatives and in his own house. They were offended at him. His own family members offended. Uh, Job chapter 19. Now, this is not only true in the life of Christ. This is also true by prophets of old and godly individuals of old, such as Job. Part of his suffering was opposition from his own family. And uh, look at Job chapter 19, verse 13. Job indicates... He hath removed my brothers far from me, my family members. My acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have failed. My close friends have forgotten me. Those who dwell in my house, in my maidservants, count me as a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I call my servant, but he gives no answer. I beg him with my mouth. See, that servant should, you know, they're paid to serve Job, but he ignores him. Even his wife said, your breath stinks. <laughs> my breath is offensive to my wife. I always like that for her. <laughs> you have chronic halitosis. <laughs> I am repulsive to the children of my own body. Notice that. Even young children despise me. I arise and they speak against me. And that was little kids mocking him, making fun of him. All my close friends abhor me. Those whom I love have turned against me. He describes his physical condition. My bones cling to my skin and to my flesh and have escaped by the skin of my teeth, meaning I'm barely alive. I'm skin and bones, wasting away. Look what Job said in verse 23. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Hey, Job, we're reading them now. <laughs> God did record those. Uh, notice verse 25. But ultimately his occupation was with the coming Messiah or Redeemer. For I know my Redeemer lives. And he shall stand at last day on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I will see God. He had a hope in the resurrection because of the Redeemer, the Messiah. His focus, even back then, was on the coming Messiah. Our focus should be upon him. He is first and foremost in our life, above anyone and everyone. And therefore, we should make him a priority in following him. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. 1 Samuel Chapter 17, verse 28. 
You remember when David uh, innocently went to deliver um, something to the armies when the uh, Goliath was there? This is an account of David and Goliath. And his brothers misunderstood his motives. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when they spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David and said, Why did you come down here? They're misjudging his motives. With whom have you in these few, those few sheep in the wilderness? You left only those few sheep. Notice that. Your jaw is not important. I know your pride, false, false accusation. You can read his heart. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. You just want to see the gore and blood. That's the only reason why you're here. Wow. That wasn't David at all. They did not know his heart. They misjudged his motive. And David was the one, the only one, who would stand up and defeat Goliath. Man looks where on the outward appearance? Where does God look? Heart. It's exactly right. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for the example of the Savior who was obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And even though the nation did not understand him, many in the nation opposed him, wanted him murdered. His own brothers did not believe in him, but yet he still fulfilled your plan without fail. And we are saved because of that. We thank you, Lord, for the Savior. Help us, Lord, when we stand up for truth, when we are opposed, when we are made fun of, when we're not understood, even by those around us, to not fear or not cower or not stop doing what you have called us to do, but be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, before.